So welcome to our second Explorations in Archaeology of the semester. Explorations is a graduate student run colloquium hosted at the University of Kansas in the Department of Anthropology. Our speaker today is Jordan Pratt. Jordan Pratt is currently a PhD candidate in anthropology at Texas A&M University, working with the Center for the Study of the First Americans. Her research focuses on the lithic technological organization strategies employed by indigenous people living in the Northern Great Basin at the end of the last ice age. She is currently working at Weed Lake Ditch, an open air Western stem site located in the Harney Basin, Southeastern Oregon. Welcome Jordan. Thank you so much for inviting me and for having me today. So today I'm gonna talk to y'all a little bit about parts of my ongoing dissertation research. So specifically, we're going to look at stemmed point technology in southeastern Oregon in the Harney Basin, which you can see from the pictures down here is a pretty diverse landscape um, that's full of kind of uplands with lots of different primary obsidian sources, wetlands. Um, it's one of the most productive wetland environments that still exists in North America. It's on the Pacific Flyway. And so there's lots of different resources that drew people there, um, both in the past and today. And then I'm gonna kind of circle around from talking more regionally about what's going on with Western STEM points um, to talking about Weed Lake Ditch, which is one of the archeological sites that I'm excavating for my dissertation. Um, so, and also if anyone has questions, just feel free to ask, I'm fine with that. Um, so for folks that maybe aren't as familiar with stem points because they're more <laughs> familiar with Clovis or for other um, earlier lithic technologies in North America, um, stem point technologies are obviously present across the entire, um, like North, all of North America, but they are very prevalent in the Western parts of North America. And the Western STEM tradition or techno complex, depending on who you're reading and how they're defining it, is made up of anywhere from like five to nine different kinds of stemmed points, um, depending on how archaeologists have typed them out. And you can kind of see from this picture that there's a pretty variable um, shape in the stemmed points that people were using, primarily as spears. Um, they tend to have the stems themselves, which is where they would have been hafted, um, we think, into split socket shafts. Um, some of the points are more shouldered um, and others lack shoulders completely. But things that they do kind of generally have in common, they tend to be pretty large and thick in cross section. They tend to have um, really heavily ground stems, which is where they would have been put into a haft itself. Um, and generally, but not always, they tend to have this kind of broad collateral flaking that goes across to the midline. Um, these points like don't exist by themselves. They're part of a pretty robust toolkit that's made up of other like bifacial tools, unifacial scrapers, gravers, um, things that would have been used to process hides. There's also osseous um, or bone technology that's been found in association with some of these stem points. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when I talk about Weed Lake Ditch, but that includes both bone needles and also decorative items like beads that are found in association with stem points. Um, like I said, stem points are found primarily at least Western stem points as they're defined in the Western United States in the Great Basin, the Columbia River Plateau. And then depending on how you define um, the Western stem tradition, there are different point types that are found in California uh, and even onto the Channel Islands as well. Um, in this region, they seem to represent some of the earliest types of lithic technology in the region. Um, I personally am not going to engage in the Western stem versus Clovis debate of which is older, um, but it is an important part of our understanding of the peopling of the Americas and how people may have migrated into this area. At least right now, I think we can say that there are um, sites such as Paisley Caves, Bonneville Estates Rock Shelter, Smith Creek Cave, 
and Cooper's Ferry, where there are stem points um, that are used at least in times that are coeval with Clovis. Um, whether people were there prior to Clovis is up for de debate. And at a lot of those sites, the earliest occupations don't necessarily actually have stem points within them. So we don't necessarily know what the earliest people were actively using. But it is part of the larger landscape of looking at the migration of people into the Americas. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about two of the um, stem point forms that are most common that we're going to talk about, um, especially in association with Weed Lake Ditch. And the first are Haskett points, which for folks that are maybe more familiar with um, the Plains archaeological sequence, they look fairly similar to Agate Basin points. Um, they are pretty large. The largest one that's been found is like over 20 centimeters long. Um, they lack distinct shoulders. Um, so generally the actual stem is longer than the blade. Um, and we again think they were hafted with split, um, split socket shafts. Um, they were defined um, in the 1960s in the Snake River Plain in Idaho. And they've been found throughout both the Great Basin and the Columbia River Plateau. Recently, there's been a real push to try to kind of get at how old some of the different stem points in the Great Basin are. And Haskett is one of the better dated point types within the Western stem tradition. And they seem to be pretty closely associated with younger Dryas age sites. Um, so for those that are unfamiliar, the younger Dryas is the cold snap at the end of the last ice age. Um, and so they seem to be younger Dryas in age about 12,600 to 11,700 years ago, at least in the Northern um, Great Basin, which is the area where I do my research. The other point type is uh, perhaps, a little extreme, but the other artifact I wanted to talk about because they're pretty common in this area and they'll come back later on are crescents. Um, so crescents are these kind of unique stone tools that have a lot of different shapes, but primarily they're kind of lunate, which is where the crescent name comes from itself. Um, and they can be anywhere from kind of a like casual lunate to this butterfly form that has a more distinct shape to it. And then even there are eccentric forms that are anthropomorphic and shaped like different animals and stuff like that. Um, so these artifacts are commonly found in association with Western stem tradition artifacts. So they're kind of lumped into the Western stem tradition, even though they're not Western stem points themselves. They're not super well dated, but they do seem to be at sites and in locations that are related to like basically shorelines um, that would have occurred during the end of the Pleistocene, the end of the last ice age. There is a crescent from the Warner Valley that dates to about 9,600 years ago. Um, and then actually at Weed Lake Ditch, we were able to radiocarbon date some of the crescents that we have there, which is why I wanted to talk about them. Um, Archaeologists don't really agree on what crescents were used for because they're found in sites along the Pacific Flyway, um, including in the Great Basin and in the Channel Islands. They're often found in association with wetland habitats, and some archaeologists think that they were used potentially to hunt waterfowl, um, how they would have been hafted. Is a, is a debate, but um, potentially with the points facing out or facing down. Um, other archaeologists think that they were likely used to process plants. Um, there is ethnographic evidence of both of these. Um, so again, it's kind of highly debated, but they are pretty common throughout the area. So now I'm going to transition to talking a little bit about the Harney Basin, which is where I do my research. So this is um, southeastern Oregon. You can kind of see from the Oregon inset map. Um, during the last ice age, um, the Harney Basin had the largest pluvial ice age lake um, in Oregon. At its height, pluvial Lake Malheur was around 1,500 square kilometers. 
So it was a pretty huge lake and you can kind of see the shape of the lake at its high sand in the gray on the map. And then underneath, it's a little bit hard to tell, but you can see the blue, which is the like extent of the lake today. Um, and this aerial photo kind of shows the lake today. So the big dry spot is actually what would have been part of the lake, but is mostly a dry playa today. So it's actually a lake chain that's made up of Lake Malheur, which is right here. And that's where most of the water is today. And when there's a lot of rainfall, the lake will overflow into Mud Lake, which is kind of in between the two at the Narrows, and then into Harney Lake, which is what the dry playa is today. Um, during the last ice age, there was a really productive wetland associated with all of Pluvial Lake now here. The lake itself is pretty shallow. So some of the like large ice age lakes in like Nevada and Utah got like hundreds of meters deep. Lake Malheur itself was probably maximum about 30 meters deep. So because of that, there tended to be a lot more wetlands um, associated with that. And what we see is that there are a lot of archeological sites in the area today too. So I don't know how familiar everyone is with kind of like the Ice Age archeological sites, early Pleistocene, early Holocene archeological sites in the area. But I just wanted y'all to see that kind of this basin is basically east of where places like the Paisley Caves and Conley Caves are. Those tend to be the more commonly recognized or known archeological sites in this region. And so we're just a little bit further to the east in a different lake basin, but a lot of the archeology span is really similar. So a big part of my dissertation research is looking at stemmed points that were found in the hydrographic Harney Basin. So what that just means is the internally draining basin, um, which you can see in the outline here. And specifically, I am looking at stem point technology that was, that was found, identified, and collected basically on public land, so on Bureau of Land Management lands. Um, the majority of these artifacts were actually collected by the BLM itself. They had a large like public archaeology project where the archaeologists would work with avocational archaeologists from the Oregon Archaeological Society and do surveys where they looked for basically, they called it the Clovis Quest. So they would look for, um, they were looking for Clovis, but they found a lot of stemmed points and some Clovis points as well. But um, so most of the artifacts that I looked at were from um, their surveys. I also have artifacts that were collected on BLM land by um, Pat O'Grady, who is actually currently an archeologist for the Burns District. But when he collected the points, he was working for the Museum of Natural and Cultural History at the University of Oregon, as well as artifacts that were collected by me and researchers who worked at the archeological sites, Weed Lake Ditch and um, Niles that make up part of my dissertation. So it's kind of all of these points are from surface surveys. They were all collected um, over the last 30 years on BLM land. And you can kind of see here where the BLM land is in comparison to where a lot of the artifacts have been found. So there's not equal kind of survey strategy over all of the BLM lands, but there are artifacts that have been found kind of throughout all of the land that they've managed. Um, I looked at about 500 different artifacts um, and I identified three, around 360 of them to be different kinds of stem points and then identified an additional 30 crescents. So I'm not gonna kind of belabor this, but basically I did a lot of metric and non-metric um, analysis. So different measurements of the width, the thickness, you know, the basic kind of lithic measurements as well as looking at things like the flaking um, pattern, the cross section, longitudinally and transverse, what kind of heat treatment was present if artifacts were heat treated and things like that. Um, basically, I was able to identify over 300, like I said, and 50 stem points. Um, I was pretty conservative about how I typed the stemmed points because 
I didn't want basically most of them are highly fragmentary pieces where you can tell that they're part of the stemmed base they're really heavily ground you can tell that they're part of one of these stemmed artifacts just based on size alone but I didn't want to type them to specific um, like named types because I wanted to try to see if I could figure out if there was any morphological difference between the different stemmed types and um, spoiler alert, people have been trying to do this for like over 50 years and I, like all of the people before me, I'm having a hard time of like actually coming up with a good metric way to separate them out. Um, so part of that has kind of led to just a general ID of different types. But what you can see is that all of the different point types are pretty much distributed across the basin. When we look at actual kind of like trying to look at spatially, if there's any difference to point types, the one thing that seems to be occurring is basically that in the south um, eastern part of the basin, which is, can you guys see my arrow? Okay, cool. Um, like this area is the Steens Mountains and this Steens Mountain, this is the highest part in, of the basin. The elevation goes over um, 9,400 feet. So it's pretty high elevation. And what seems to be occurring is that none of the stemmed points that date to earlier in time, so no, no, none of the like Hosket points or anything like that, that date to the Younger Dryas are found in these high elevations. And that's probably partially because these areas were glaciated during that period. So it makes sense that people weren't up there. But then after the ice melted, folks were moving probably more into the uplands. Um, when we look at it just kind of spatially, you can see that the majority of the points are kind of found in the western and central part of the basin. This is where most of the really productive wetlands would be. Um, unfortunately, I think part of the distribution that we see here in the density is likely a byproduct of how the BLM was surveying. So, these tended to be areas that they went back to frequently, which means they disproportionately found stem points there. So <laughs> whether this density is actually showing us anything real is kind of um, debatable. But in general, there's just a fairly low density over a lot of the different parts of the land that is managed by the BLM. Um, one of the things that I was most interested in looking at when I was kind of analyzing the stem points and looking at the diversity of what is going on here is trying to figure out what kind of raw material folks were using to produce these points and what that could tell us about mobility and settlement strategies in the past. Um, and this map shows all of the obsidian sources that are identified nearby within the basin. You can see that there are a ton of different obsidian sources. This doesn't actually even show all of them, but there are over 20 distinct obsidian sources that are located in the basin itself. And that can kind of complicate how we identify patterns um, in the past. But what is really clear is that even though there are other lithic raw materials like fine grain volcanics, basalt, things like that, andesites, as well as chirts that are locally available. Folks that were making stem points in this region were preferentially using obsidian to produce them. So over 84% of the artifacts that I analyzed were obsidian, and then only about 13% was fine green volcanic and less than 3% was made on cryptocrystalline silicate, so chirts and things like that. So they seem to be preferentially using obsidians. Um, and what I wanted to try to get at was whether we could see if there are any types of obsidian that folks are using more frequently than others. So I apologize, it's like very hard to try to synthesize this information visually on a map. But what this map shows is the Harding Basin itself. And then basically any colored triangle shows an obsidian source that was identified geochemically um, and associated with a stemmed point. So I was able to actually get 126 artifacts sourced. So most of those I sourced myself. I sourced um, 88 myself. 
using uh, portable x-ray fluorescence. And then I sent an additional 60 artifacts to um, the Northwest Research Obsidian Studies Lab, and they were able to identify um, obsidian sources that I didn't have in my own geochemical library. Um, and basically in total over, well, 27 different obsidian sources were identified. And this includes both obsidian sources within the basin, as well as obsidian sources that are located kind of further to the west. Um, and those obsidian sources are sources that we see pop up at sites like Paisley Cave and Conley Cave, as well as one source um, from California, Cowhead Lake, that's right at the bottom. Um, when I look at how obsidian is actually being transported, the minimum distance between an obsidian source and the location where the artifact was um, basically recovered in the present and presumably discarded in the past is around two kilometers. And the maximum distance that obsidian was transported was um, 216 kilometers. So on average, we see that folks who are making these stem points were not preferentially choosing the obsidians that were located closest to the site where the artifact was discarded. So almost every site is located, um, has a local obsidian source. So that just means anything within 20 kilometers of the site. But most obsidian um, artifacts are actually being made on sources that are non-local to the site of discard. So the majority of them are being made on obsidians that average between about 44 and 91 kilometers away, depending on which specific type of Western stem point you're looking at. Um, there doesn't seem to be any statistical difference between the different stemmed point types and the distance that obsidian was being transported. So what that indicates to me is that basically the stem points themselves, the folks were not employing different like residential or logistical foraging strategies, um, even if they were using different stemmed point types. Um, and I tried to kind of look at whether folks had, like, if there was any statistical difference or procurement premium, like, preference. And there doesn't, there's just statistically not a big difference between the point types. So it's actually kind of an interesting pattern because it shows that even though there's obsidian all over the landscape, people aren't preferentially choosing the closest obsidian. So they seem to at least have identified and know sources on the landscape that they want to use more and they're doing that. Um, so about 69% of the artifacts are made on non-local obsidians. Um, and this is pretty similar to patterns in nearby basins. Um, it is pretty different to other Paleo-Indian and Western stems. Um, sites located in other parts of the Great Basin where folks seem to be transporting obsidian much longer distances. And likely it's just probably a result of the fact that there's so much obsidian here that you don't have to transport it long distances. If you're gonna come across an obsidian um, frequently, you don't have to move it 400 kilometers, right? You can pick up something maybe 40 kilometers away. But it does seem like people are moving um, fairly frequently on large distances throughout the basin. So they do seem to be highly residentially mobile. Okay, so now I'm going to kind of shift gears and talk about Weed Lake Ditch. So you can see on this uh, nice map where I put a little circle, one of the dense spots um, where a lot of stem points are being identified is on the southeastern part of Harney Lake. Um, and that is where Weed Lake Ditch is located. So Weed Lake Ditch is kind of a weird little site. It was found in the 1970s. Basically, in the early 1900s, a farmer decided he wanted to drain Weed Lake, which you can see right here, Weed Lake Flat. He wanted to drain it into Harney Lake so that he could use the flat to grow alfalfa. And so he basically just dug this ditch, um, which you can kind of see early here. This is the ditch. It goes all the way along there. He dug it to drain um, the water out and he accidentally 
um, dug through an archaeological site, which is actually kind of convenient for us today because we didn't have to try to find it. It was literally eroding out of the ditch. So um, the site was identified eroding out of this ditch. Early archaeologists from Portland State were interested in kind of assessing the site itself and then also kind of trying to get at the age of various um, lake, lake stands in the area. So they went out and did kind of the initial research at the site and they dated the shoreline feature that the site is eroding out of um, to about 11,200 years ago. The dates are really not super great because they're on gastropod shells. So it's highly weathered shell, which is just not preferential for radiocarbon dating in general. Um, but they were able to get an age on the site itself. And what's kind of unique about Weed Lake Ditch is it's actually on a large gravel um, spit bar that kind of extends into the lake itself. So the site is located kind of within what would have been an active lake margin, as well as what later on was a wetland kind of riparian zone. So folks from the University of Nevada, Reno, specifically Teresa Risson, went back to the site in the early 2000s because when they were surveying, they found a Haskett point eroding out of the ditch. So they knew that more of the archeological site was there and they wanted to actually go ahead and excavate that. And so they excavated like basically directly on the edge of the ditch and they found a huge amount of archeological materials. So they found four haskets, they found a crescent and a bone bead preformed in their excavations, as well as like over 16,000 pieces of debitage, thousands of pieces of bone, primarily wetland birds. Um, and they were again able to date the site using a gastropod shell. So their dates are a little bit older than Keith Gare's date, but still around 11,300 years ago. Um, and we were actually surveying um, in, in 2017 and found another Haskett point eroding out of the site. So we too were required to dig more here because of that. Um, you can actually see here, this is the Haskett point that we found eroding out of the ditch. Um, this picture up top shows the actual ditch itself and several of the undergrads who worked with me excavating kind of along the margin of the ditch. And so what we did is this like red blob is where Teresa Riston put in her excavation units. And then we put in excavation units um, directly to the east of that and um, trying to kind of tie into her units. And then we actually found this kind of weird really highly weathered, sorry, this picture is terrible, but um, it's a little fragment of like a fluted point variant. I wouldn't call it Clovis. It doesn't fit the like attributes in terms of size and stuff of Clovis, but it does have a flute scar. And we found it over here. Um, so we decided to actually put in some more units kind of further to the south and to the east of where the main excavation block that Teresa Riston excavated was just to see if there was anything else out there. Um, and so those are where our excavation blocks are in comparison to hers. The sediment here is, a lot of it is fairly clayey and it tends to get a little petty. So we wet screened um, and initially we were only wet screening like a 50 by 50 centimeter um, portion of each of our one by one meter blocks because that is what Teresa Riston did. And that was how she identified her bone bead preform. Um, we, our first year, found a bone um, needle fragment in a wet screen. So then after that, we ended up just wet screening everything, which was good in terms of like finding osseous um, artifacts, but terrible in terms of how long it took to actually like pick through the screens. Um, I was doing that for like over a year after getting out of the field, but it was worth it. Um, so there actually go forward. No, there we go. Um, so when we look at the actual distribution of artifacts at the site, not all of these units are fully excavated. So especially the southern units kind of here in the west block are not finished. So that's partially why they're so sparse. 
But what you can like really quickly see from looking at this is that our Eastern block, which is the one further away from the ditch was a lot more productive in terms of the amount of artifacts that we were finding. Um, and I think partially this is because it's further away from the active lake margin. So it's better protected and better preserved. But in both areas of the site, we have a fairly similar kind of um, artifact assemblage that's coming out of the pretty much similar um, stratigraphic unit. I'm not gonna go into the geoarchaeology, but um, because we'll be here forever, but um, basically there is a really robust Paleo-Indian component at the site. Most of the artifacts are directly related to bifacial reduction. Um, what's kind of interesting about Weed Lake Ditch is like, I just talked about how much obsidian there is in the basin. This site is actually located within five kilometers of a chert source. And the majority of the artifacts that are stoned from the site are made on chert and not on obsidian. So it's a very different pattern um, than what we see in other locations. But basically we see a lot of stem point technology, primarily half get points. We have found 14 crescents from varied context, um, well, 15. And that's the mo most that have been ever found in a varied context in the Great Basin. And what's interesting here is that they are in association with the Haskett points themselves. So they appear to be part of the same lithic toolkit um, that also includes things like scrapers, gravers, and then um, osseous technology as well. We were able to radiocarbon date two of the bones from the site. Um, these bones are unfortunately not, they're part of the same basically cultural component as the Haskets and the Crescents, but it's I was not able to identify a hearth, so they are not from a hearth or anything like that. Um, but the one bone, um, which is probably a long bone of a waterfowl, that's most closely associated with several stem points as well as a bone needle is this upper age here. So it's about 12,600 to 12,100 years old. And this actually pushes the age of the site back about a thousand years from what Teresa Riston and Keith Gear, Gear were able to identify using their gastropod um, dating methods. So I think it's a better age for the site just because it has gone through a more pretreatment and active kind of assessment for the radiocarbon age. And what's interesting is that this means that Weed Lake Ditch is similar in age to a lot of the other Haskett sites in the region. So it dates to the Younger Dryas period um, and it is pretty similar to other sites of that age. Okay, so now I wanna just show you some of the artifacts that we are finding. So. Mostly, we seem to have um, a full manufacture sequence of stem points and bifacial technology at the site, specifically haskets. So the only type of artifact that I was able to ID to a type were hasket points. There are other stemmed fragments. You can see some of them here. They're pretty beat up and they don't have any distinct shoulders or anything. So I haven't been able to type them out to anything different. But what we see is like you can, this particular artifact is actually a preform. Um, it has the, it's made on a flake blank. So the actual platform of the flake is still there. And we see like early flake scar removals across. Um, and the full manufacture sequence is identified both in terms of the types of bike faces that we're finding at the site, as well as the type of debitage or stone flakes that we're finding as the byproducts of creating those um, artifacts themselves. Um, primarily the haskets are made on obsidian and fine grained volcanics, um, but there is one which you can see here that was made on the local chart itself um, and has gone through heat treatment because of that. And Oh, let's see if I can actually press next. We also, like I said, identified 15 crescents so far. Um, what's interesting about the crescents at the site is that they're primarily made on chert, which is fairly common throughout the region. There are some that are made on fine grained volcanic and obsidian. Um, we kind of have different types of crescents for lack of a better term. So there are a couple of kind of trends that I've noticed in actually analyzing the artifacts. 
So there are some that are basically retouched flakes that have been created into a crescentic shape. So they have been like actively retouched along the margin to create that shape or just to follow the natural shape itself. You can see those up here. And then there are bifacial crescents that have been actively worked on both sides. Um, there are some that are quite small compared to others, which is kind of the second row, and then these larger ones. Um, all of the bifacial crescents have edge grinding on the midline, which potentially indicates that they were hafted in some way. Um, that doesn't really indicate what they were used for after they were hafted. So I think probably the diversity in the shape and the type of retouch that's going on in the crescents indicates that they weren't all being used for the same activity. Um, so like how I'm not going to enter into Western stem versus Clovis, I also in this presentation am not going to determine what crescent points were used for, but there are a lot of them and it is really cool. And because they are in association with the stem points and in the cultural component, these are the earliest dated crescents um, in the region. So it gives us kind of like the earliest evidence of these artifacts from a buried context as opposed to just from surficial finds. And then I just wanted to show you some of the obvious technology from the site. So we have found two bone needle fragments. Um, they correspond in size to other Paleo-Indian um, needles throughout North America. So they tend to have like an eye uh, width of about three to one millimeters in diameter. So they're really small. Um, they were drilled from both sides and the eyes, yeah, so the eyes appear drilled from both sides. Um, when we see kind of like a general distribution of Paleo-Indian bone needles, they tend to be found at domestic sites where they're sewing and lots of hides um, preparation. So they tend to be found in association with a lot of scrapers and gravers. Um, there are some of those artifacts here at Wade Lake Ditch, but those aren't the only type of artifacts being found. So I don't necessarily think of this as like a sewing camp, but there is evidence of a lot of different kinds of activities going on. So it may be evidence that Weed Lake Ditch is a longer term occupation site where it's not just used for hunting or for procuring waterfowl and wetland resources, but people were living there for a little bit longer. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is this kind of weird artifact down here. So these artifacts are pretty similar to some that have been found at Sentinel Gap, which is in Washington. Um, and the archaeologists who excavated that site refer to them as bone bead preforms. So they tend to be kind of, you can see they've been actively um, kind of worked in the middle and kind of snapped on the end. Um, so this particular artifact has like striations on the top, which is actually from the abrasion of the shaping of the bone itself. Um, and it's weird. I think the artif the authors of the work at Sentinel Gap think that the final form of these beads would have required them to snap them and then drill them to create like an actual hole that could be threaded through. Um, I think it would be really hard, at least with the artifact that I found, to actually do that without breaking it, um, which doesn't mean that it wasn't possible, but I think potentially that this might be closer to what the actual final form is, and that it would have been wrapped around um, the edge down here, the kind of like hourglass part of the artifact itself, and not necessarily drilled through, but up for debate. Okay. Kind of last thing I want to talk about is the obsidian from Weed Lake Ditch itself. So the obsidian um, is actually shows pretty similar patterns to what we see when we look at the larger stemmed point um, artifact collection that I was talking about earlier. There are a lot of artifacts that are made of on obsidian and they are from throughout the region. So I was able to um, source 37 artifacts from Weed Lake Ditch to add on to the artifacts that have been previously sourced by Teresa Riston. So this map shows all of the obsidian sources that Teresa Riston identified. 
Um, I was actually able to identify four more sources um, that were found at Weed Lake Ditch. So Beatty Butte, which is located primarily to the south in the Catlow Basin, as well as a couple of sources, Chickahominy and Double O, that are located west of the site. And one of the Haskett points was actually made on Double O, which is one of the closest obsidian sources and fine-grained volcanic sources to Weed Lake Ditch itself as well as Tule Spring, which is kind of located in the uplands east of the lake itself. So there seem to be similar patterns um, in the sense that there isn't necessarily preferential choice of a local obsidian, but there's a large scale movement of lots of regional obsidian um, to the site itself, even though most of the lithic raw material there is made out of chert. So just kind of to finish up, basically our work is fairly preliminary, even though I swear I'm close to being done with my dissertation, um, but it does seem to kind of corroborate and expand on work that's been done throughout the region. So we can pretty safely say that Weed Lake Ditch is a younger driest age site that has both caskets and crescents in a buried context along with other osseous tools that are fairly unique. Um, and the lithic procurement strategies that folks were using at the end of the last ice age seem to be similar to those of other nearby basins in the sense that there was a fairly high residential mobility where folks seemed to be moving across the landscape, but they weren't necessarily transporting super exotic raw materials um, into the different archeological sites. All right. So that's it. And I just want to acknowledge that um, all of this work was done on Northern Paiute land, specifically the Wadataka um, band, so the Burns Paiute. And there are a lot of different folks who contributed to this research, including um, Dr. Ted Gable, who is at KU. So part of my work when I was at KU last year um, was working on the STEM point. So I just wanted to say that too. All right, that's it. Sorry, that was a lot. What? Did it? Thanks. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. So I think we have um, a little bit of time for questions. If anybody has anything they'd like to ask for folks online, you're welcome to unmute and ask those or ask them in the chat as well. I know I just dumped so much information on you, so I apologize. <laughs> I I mean, I have a question because I'm not super familiar with Western STEMed. Do yeah. we, like, are different styles of points or different point types associated with kind of different economic strategies at all or different like specializations as far as like regions or game, anything like that? Are they just not really? So one of the problems with Western stem archaeology in general is that like the majority of Western stem artifacts and sites are surface sites that have been found kind of like on lake margins or they're cave sites. Um, and caves obviously are like not the only thing that folks would have been doing on the landscape. It seems like most of them are in association with both wetlands, but then also in, with artiodactyl use. Um, so there is artiodactyl, like there are bison, other large game that have been found at Western stem sites. There isn't a big breakdown in terms of what they could have been used for, no. There is starting to be increasingly a little bit of a split in the age of some of the stemmed points. Um, so Haskett tends to be earlier in the sequence, and then Parman points are a little bit later in the sequence, followed by wind dust. But that's not the the pattern. Like there's not a great age for where they occur all over the Great Basin. So it's kind of an ongoing point of investigation, shall we say? <laughs> but yeah, it would be interesting if there was a clear split, and it would be nice if it was easier to tell why they were there were different Western stem types. 
Anyone looking at the fauna besides like duck, potential like waterfowl and stuff like that, do you know what other kind of genera you have or anything like that? So at Weed Lake Ditch, I don't have anyone actively looking at the fauna for that I've excavated. The previous um, excavation did have a zooarchaeologist go through the fauna. The majority of it was waterfowl. So there are lots of different, like, kind of late spring, early summer waterfowl that were identified. There was some artiodactyl bone identified and then also small game. So lots of rabbits and then other small kind of like mic sized things. So it's a little bit hard because it's an open air site that's been wetted and dried so much. There aren't any like clear um, features that have been identified either by Teresa Riston or me. So it's a little bit hard to like definitively show what was like an economic use by folks in the past versus something that got incorporated into the site later, like for instance, rabbit potentially. Um, but it does seem like they were using a lot of different resources. For any of the stone projectiles found in situ? Like were they found within like near each other or was it like, how were they? You know, yeah, sure. yeah, they were found near each other. So most of the diagnostic artifacts were found in C2. I was working with undergrads, so not all of them were found in C2, but <laughs> that's how it goes. Um, and they were found kind of spatially. Let me see if I can go back. Um, they were found close to each other. It's a pretty thick um, stratigraphic band. I should have just put up a picture of the actual um stratigraphy itself so sorry for that but this does kind of show spatially at least mm -hmm. how they were found mm -hmm. that way mm -hmm. the main cultural component it, depending on where you are in the site is anywhere from like 15 to 30 centimeters so it isn't necessarily that all of them were found like in the exact same like living floor part of the problem is weed lake ditch is on an active lake margin and so the site did go through like active post-depositional basically deformation both by the lake as well as through kind of like bioturbation um so I would not say that it's like perfect granted I wouldn't say any archaeological site is really perfect in terms of geoarchaeology um, but they do seem to be closely associated, associated with each other and we see kind of shifts in the uh, type of kind of like stratigraphic unit so they tend to be in what looks like it would have been like an active lake margin with larger um, pebbles and cobbles that were being moved and washed over by water versus other areas that were kind of maybe undergoing aeolian transport so you can st stratigraphically like pick it out and at least in the west block the cultural component is over a meter deep um, in the east block, um, the upper layer from the ditch, which is what protected the western block of the site, is gone. And so it's a deflated surface where almost immediately you're in the active archaeological component. But they are kind of geomorphically similar um, stratigraphic units to each other. So. Okay, well, if that's it for questions, um, I think we're all set to wrap up. Thank you so much, Jordan. That was awesome. And thanks for having me. See people in a month for our last explorations of the semester on November 29th with Meredith Snow talking about some ancient DNA from.